coming uh, and for inviting me to speak. This is awesome. I'm really excited to be here, uh, partly just because I'm new to the area and I was really looking forward to um, having a chance to introduce myself, uh, you know, and give you guys a sense of the type of work that I've done in the past and what I'll probably continue to do uh, in the future. So this talk is kind of a get a flavor of the type of things I do. Um, there, there are a couple different projects I'll talk about, um, but really I want you to get a sense of um, the type of tools and techniques I use so that hopefully if it's interesting to you and something you, uh, you know, want to work on at all in the future, we can definitely talk and try to figure some stuff out. So um, if at any point you have any questions, feel free to stop me and ask. Try to be as casual as I can here. <laughs> Um, all right, I work on coral algal symbioses, and um, particularly the molecular side of that. Um, and the way things have worked out with all of those postdocs and things, I've mostly focused on uh, corals for most of my career. And um, the major research theme that sort of emerged is what are the molecular mechanisms that govern the establishment, maintenance, and breakdown of marine mutualisms? Um, I mostly work on corals, but I've also done some work with zoanthariums and sea anemones and pretty much anything that associates with a particular type of algal symbiont. Um, and to do that, I use a combination of scuba and going out into the field and collecting samples, uh, lab experiments and tanks, um, and a lot of genomics. So I've really done a lot of DNA sequencing, RNA-seq experiments, next-generation sequencing, on the host and symbiont component of the Coral Algal Association. Now, since we're at the um, College of Marine Science, I'm sure you guys are very familiar with coral reefs and their importance and why we care about maintaining all of this biodiversity. Uh, so I'm not going to get into it too much, except to say that you know, when we look at healthy reef, we see that there's a lot of diversity on various levels. So, um, Reef structures are composed of many different species, and within each species you have physiologically separated colonies, and then within the colonies you have all the individual clonal polyps, and then if you squint really hard you might see the symbionts, but not really because you need a microscope. But these are my favorite, um, often called Zuzantheli, uh, Symbiodinium, or now the new family name is Symbiodiniacea. And so these guys are uh, photosymbionts. They're packed with chlorophyll, and they um, are really the foundation of the reef. If you don't have this association, um, this mutualism between corals and these symbionts, you don't get quite the same rate of growth that um, you find here in the tropics, where it's typically very nutrient poor. So um, the association is based on nutrition, and um, corals do better off with their partner than without. And so if you do a cross-section through a polyp, you're going to see that the symbionts are found in the gastrodermal tissue, and they're actually intracellular, so they're inside the host cells. And that's a really weird thing from an evolutionary perspective, you know, capturing some photosynthetic oxygen-producing organism and putting it into your cell when oxygen is sort of toxic in high concentration, right? Um, so how exactly did these guys, you know, start playing with each other nicely and um, how do they maintain that association? And, and of course, how does it break down when we have situations like coral bleaching? Um, so this brings up uh, several different questions. And I've tried to hit on some of them in the work that I've done. Uh, one level is looking at cell biology. So what molecules are being shuttled back and forth um, what molecules are on the surface of the symbiont cells or are the coral host cells that allow them to interact and potentially recognize each other? Um, how, how is the host coral's immune system basically tolerating an invader? You know, and how did that situation evolve? Um, the evolutionary questions, again, uh, get to issues of... Um, you know, how, how is the diversity that we see out there and the specificity that we see among coral hosts and their algal symbionts maintained? You know, there's a whole lot of different species of corals and a whole lot of different species of algae. And yet, if you sample a particular coral, you're, you can predict which symbionts are going to be there. 
And that's sort of true in many places. So there's specificity in the system. How do you maintain that when you could potentially switch out with alternate partners? Um, and last again, we get into ecology questions and you know, the, the issues facing shared uh, symbioses um, and how those respond to environmental change and at what point something that is beneficial transitions to being a potential problem, right? And so that gets us into coral bleaching and yeah, <laughs> it's not great. Um, now the bleaching phenomenon is really, it, it encompasses a lot of different things which sometimes isn't really recognized that, you know, it's not just heat stress. You know, you could cold stress a coral and it can bleach. You can keep a coral in the dark and it might bleach. So it's this uh, sort of um, bigger picture response that has many different routes uh, to get to. And then how they actually bleach can be different too, whether it's ejecting healthy symbiont cells, whether it's ejecting um, host cells that have their symbionts inside of them, whether it's autophagy. Um, so on the cellular side of things, there are different ways for the association to break down too. Um, heat stress gets all the attention, and that's mostly what I'll, I'll be talking about today. So we know that bleaching events are becoming more common and, and frequent, um, and that there's less chance for recovery between bleaching events, and that's sort of uh, causing concern about the resilience of corals over time and, and in the near future, right? So we've got plenty of examples of coral reefs degrading um, in various locations for various reasons, right? Again, you know, it's not just heat stress. We, we pollute the oceans, um, go out there and blow corals up occasionally. So there are all sorts of stressors that are affecting corals. But um, one thing that we know for a fact is that the oceans are continuing to get warmer and so and, and we have a, a sense of that trajectory. So the question that emerges that I want to try to address a bit is can coral algal mutualisms evolve rapidly enough to keep pace with climate change? Um, we know that if they don't evolve they have a particular threshold and once you go beyond that that's it you've you've bleached and you'll likely die because at that point you're immune compromised. If however you can evolve and you know, develop um, thermal tolerance or increase your thermal tolerance over generational times, um, you have a, a chance of raising that threshold uh, so that you can persist into the future. And so this is a really big question. Can coral algal mutualisms evolve? Um, and can they do it quickly? And it, that's a very hard question to answer. And um, don't trust anyone who tells you they know the answer. Uh, you can study it in, in one coral and get one answer and in another and get a different one because these are very distinct associations. Um, but I'm going to tell you a story about uh, some of the corals that I've studied and how I think, uh, you know, there is some evidence that they could potentially evolve uh, relatively quickly um, to respond to some, some of the changes that are happening in the environment today. Um, and very basic idea about evolution and responding to stressors um, is that diversity is your friend, right? So this is just sort of a little diagram of, it's called a genetic bottleneck. You start off on one side with a lot of diversity in your system represented by different colors. We can call these corals, sure. You have some sort of extreme event. It could be a bleaching event, could be some sort of die off, um, an asteroid hitting the earth. Anyway, you, during that time period, um, most of your diversity is lost, but you have some uh, that remain, and then those can go on and, and propagate and uh, bring the population size back up until it starts generating more diversity again. And a, a really great example out of the textbooks of this is the Irish potato famine. And the idea that if you plant monoclonal, st monoclonal strains of potatoes and they're all susceptible to one blight, if that blight comes through, you lose all of your crop, right? But if you plant diverse potatoes with um, different disease resistances, then the blight hits and sure, some of them die, but you're left with uh, some resistant individuals and they go on to um, restore the population afterwards. So can corals do this? You know, do we have any diversity in the system, you know, variation uh, like you have here in terms of uh, disease resistance that can be used to our advantage, um, or to the coral's advantage, 
uh, or are they all basically just susceptible to potato blight and lose them all at the same time? Well, Ilsa took this picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so <laughs> this, is, this is a fantastic image um, that really drives home the fact that, yes, there is variation out there. We've got two colonies of the same species of coral. They likely had the same species of symbiont. They are right next to each other on the reef. One of them bleached, and one of them didn't. So if you were going to restock you know, the corals in the future, which one of these would you pick to propagate? <laughs> yeah, the, this guy, right? Very easy. And, and in a nutshell, that's sort of what restoration is trying to do, um, or coral restoration at the moment is trying to do, is basically assess um, this variation, identify individuals that are more resilient, and then propagate them and hopefully um, you know, set them up for success in the future. Um, there are more extreme interventions where you actually go in and, and genetically change corals, but there's already a lot of variation out there. And um, it might be more practical to identify what we've already got and try to help it along. Um, so yes, there are, uh, there's diversity. And by looking at this diversity, we can get a proxy for adaptive capacity. Right? This, this is an indication that yes, there's, um, there's a chance that uh, natural selection can act on this system. So when you're studying variation and, and evolution, you want to look at variation within a population or within a species. Um, and to do that, first you have to identify different individuals. That's kind of hard with corals for a couple of reasons. But one of the primary ones is that there are two reproductive modes um, actually in both partners of the symbiosis. So the coral host can go through asexual propagation where you can basically break off a fragment. Both new fragments continue to grow happily because they're clonal organisms and each, the polyp budding means that each separate piece can continue to grow on its own. But they also spawn um, <coughs> periodically. And through the spawning process, they release gametes into the ocean, uh, sperm and egg mix, and you get larvae that then settle out and from one polyp grow up to be a large coral. So the problem here is if you go out and you're diving and you see two corals next to each other, there's no way to know if they're actually clones or if they're distinct individuals genetically. The same is true on a, a sort of different level with the symbionts. They are, we have evidence that they um, can have sex based on uh, genetics, although we've never actually observed it uh, through a microscope. We're pretty sure it has to happen. They're kind of shy. Um, but then they also, they also divide and propagate clonally. So in both systems, we need to develop a way to identify and track individuals. And the answer for that is DNA, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, I forgot I wanted to show you a picture here of corals that are, you know, here's one species of coral, and it's got a lot of different morphological uh, features, you know, depending on which colony you look at. This is phenotypic plasticity, right? If you grow in a high flow place, you might have a different uh, morphological structure. But then you ha also have examples of two corals that are different species, but they share morphologies. And they're really hard to tell apart in the field, or you, you can't really. You need to go in and look at the DNA. And that's how we know that these are all type 1 and these are all type 3. Same point with the symbionts. All right, this represents the broad diversity of Symbiodiniacea, which we currently think emerged about 120 million years ago and has been diverging ever since. And so there's a, a, lot, of, a lot of molecular diversity. You look at them under the microscope, they're just little balls of brown, right? <laughs> yeah? Do, do the corals expel zooxanthellae, or do the zooxanthellae decide it's time to leave? That's a fantastic question. And uh, I wish I was good enough at whispering to them so that they could tell me. Uh, but we, it, that's a great point. Um, and usually when I'm reading papers and stuff, I'm always trying to keep that in mind. Um, it's, it's usually categorized as a host response. Um, but there could be some component of the symbionts providing a signal to the host that it's time to go. Um, corals can expel both healthy and stressed uh, symbiont cells. So there, there's probably some mutual uh, communication going on. Um, 
Anyway, the, they all look very similar, right? You can't really use morphology. But if you look at their DNA, um, this is just a, a phylogenetic tree, which looks at, gives, gives you a sense of who's related to whom um, over evolutionary time. And if you're more closely uh, linked on the tree, then you share uh, more recent common ancestors. And the point I want to make here is just that the old genus Symbiodinium, which had several different clades in it, um, has just as much diversity within it as you see amongst all of these different genera of other dinoflagellates, which is the larger group that all of these guys belong to. So we were pretty sure for a while that you know, um, this group should be broken up. And I'm not going to harp on it too much, but I spent a good chunk of my PhD working with my advisor on coming up with a system for basically figuring out which DNA markers we could use that would let us identify individuals versus populations versus species versus different genera. And there are individual markers for each one. And if you use that hierarchical scheme, uh, we had enough evidence to sort of break the group apart into you know, each one of these clades is now a different genus. And then within each genus, there are multiple different species. And that's really important because if you don't factor in the fact that these are really diverse and distinct groups that have a bunch of members within them, you start to think along the, time, along the lines of like, oh, clade D is thermally tolerant and clade C is not. And that's not true. Um, there are members of each group that are thermally tolerant. One of the most heat resistant ones that we know of is in the C group, cladocopium. Um, and that comes from the Red Sea and the Gulf of Amman. So it, uh, having, having this type of information is really helpful for trying to look at evolution because now you're comparing apples to apples. You know that you're within a species or comparing something across different species. And then we can look at, okay, what's the variation within each species? It's, a bit, it's been a bit easier for corals because they've had an established taxonomy for a much longer time. So um, one of the key markers that we use to resolve individuals from each other are these microsatellite markers, which are rapidly evolving pieces of DNA. It's what you use to identify people at crime scenes and things like that. Um, and we can go in, and we've got them for uh, a host coral. In this case, it's Cropper palmata, which is the one I'm going to be talking about, uh, about the experiment soon. Um, and it's got a symbiont called Symbiodinium fitti. Uh, it's a member of that A clade. And it's a very stable association. These guys really like hanging out with each other and, and have for a very long time. Um, and interestingly enough, if you go and you sample one of these corals and you look at its symbionts, they're, they're clonal throughout the whole organism, and there's usually only one clone in there. So it's basically the coral host is like a culturing factory for that particular strain of algae. So you can use the microsats to identify who's who and generate maps like this. So this is a vertical or a, a top-down look on a reef, right? And these are their sort of GPS coordinates in relation to each other. And the shape of the uh, icon it indicates the host genotype, and the color indicates the symbiont genotype. And these types of maps are really useful. You know, this one's telling us that there is this red symbiont strain that's doing really well here. And it's shared amongst a bunch of different coral hosts. But then you've got some oddballs, like this green guy down here, who's also um, a different host genotype. And then in the middle, you've got a bunch of clones from uh, one individual coral colony. And one of them seems to have switched from red to blue on the symbiont. So with this type of map, we can then start asking questions about individual level variation and different combinations of coral hosts and symbionts within a host and symbiont species, um, which is kind of what this diagram is showing. You know, if you have three different strains of symbiont, three different strains of host, you have nine potential combinations of holobiont. That's the combination of the host and the symbionts. And each one of these could have different physiological performance, um, particularly uh, under different stress regimes. So, you know, these, this one might be more heat tolerant than this one. So, is it important, then, to keep track of these individual identities for restoration purposes? Should we be managing for just the host diversity, or should we also be looking at the symbiont diversity? To get at whether it was actually important, we kind of had to do some experiments, right? And um, using a reductionist approach, the first thing you want to do is actually hold one of these constant and let the other one uh, vary. Uh, 
and then test them under different scenarios. And I was lucky enough to find a reef in Mexico. This is my own really terrible version of the map that I showed you before. Um, but just demonstrating that these guys are all purple, which means they all have the same clonal symbiont strain. But they're also all different shapes. So these were six different coral colonies, genetically distinct, but they were all sharing the same symbiont. Perfect for doing our reductionist approach. Um, it would tell us if um, your host background had any effect on symbiont performance. Uh, and we would get that by measuring symbiont performance uh, under a heat stress. And that's what we did. So the design was go down to these reefs, break pieces off, put them into different temperature treatments. Here we've got a uh, 27 is sort of the um, ambient temperature at that site. 20 was a cold shock. And um, I think I said something about being interested in you know, climate change and heat stress. And I should probably have a heat temperature up here. But I don't because I killed all the corals in that treatment. So nothing ever goes quite the way you want. But um, <laughs> this was still sufficient for us to get you know, a, a temperature response and to compare it amongst different um, different colonies. So they were exposed to these temperatures for three days. And then I measured um, the, basically the photosynthetic capacity of the algae. Um, and we also took samples of RNA from the host. And what came of that? Well, these graphs are basically two different ways of looking at the same thing. The uh, metric on the y-axis is called QM. That's photosystem 2 pressure. And bottom line is the more pressure you have, the more you're feeling a particular stress. Um, you have issues shuttling your, um, your electrons at that point. And so we had two different uh, conditions. And so this is sort of a reaction norm for the six different colonies. And as you can see, some of these individuals have very little change, right? The slope is small. Um, and the change in QM over um, in these two different environments is very small. All right? But we had others where we had a much steeper slope. So that means that, what does that mean? These are clonal symbionts, right? They should respond the same way, all else being equal. But instead, they have a very different response. And that's the only thing that was different among them was which host they were in. So that tells you host background is actually really important. It's somehow modulating the performance of the symbionts and affecting the way that they photosynthesize. Huge deal in my opinion. <laughs> Try to convince other people. But, um, so yeah, we ended up with essentially these resilient symbionts. right? And then we had sensitive symbionts. I'm going to use these same colors, because it gets kind of confusing when we start talking about the host next. So what was the host doing? Uh, we didn't measure the physiology of the host at all, but we did get gene expression. right? And so back uh, in microarray times, we did a microarray um, and looked at a, a set of genes um, and this, this group came out as being important. Now, they both change basically in the same direction in both. Um, the, sorry, let me step back one second. We, we had to pick two, uh, a subset of corals to compare. So for the microarray experiment, we basically pooled DNA from these two hosts and these two hosts, and then used that as our way of measuring um, gene expression on the array. And so we had the green um, symbionts were resilient. They were in hosts that are highlighted in green here. Okay? And the orange ones are in the orange. And we called those dynamic hosts and static hosts. And that's because in these dynamic ones with the green, you have a very clear change from very light to very dark. These are just heat maps, right? So um, they reflect the, the gene expression value. Lower numbers are going to be really light. Higher numbers are going to be really dark. And so all these genes changed in the same direction, but the extent to which they changed was much greater in these colonies that we're calling dynamic hosts versus the static ones where the change was there, but it wasn't as big. And in fact, none of these were actually statistically significant, whereas they were here. OK, great. So what we're seeing is corals that are hosting symbionts that perform well under stress are changing their gene expression to a higher degree and somehow modulating the internal environment. We, we predict that it's changing the internal environment that the symbionts are exposed to, um, which is in turn affecting their performance. What are those conditions in the intracellular environment? 
Um, you can make a story out of anything, so you know, this is just an idea of what might be happening. A lot of the genes in here were involved in uh, ferritin and um, oxidative stress genes, and also glutaredox and redox homeostasis. And both of these pathways are actually connected to each other, and they both modulate how, um, how the symbiont might be perceiving the environment, whether you, uh, the host can actually deal with the hydrogen peroxide that's being produced by the symbiont, um, and whether it can sort of shunt it away. Uh, so it seems to make sense based on these genes that um, there's actually an interaction going on uh, and communication on, on some level signaling using these ROS uh, patterns. And you get reactive oxygen species under uh, a thermal stress uh, in both the host and the symbiont. Lastly, and this is just sort of anecdotal evidence, but the um, the holobionts that were buffering their symbionts from the external environment spawned that year, and the ones that were not buffered did not spawn. <laughs> Another big deal for evolution, right? Because if you're not spawning, you're not passing on your genes. And so it seems that there's this feedback where a symbiont is in a particular host. That host provides it with an environment that it likes. That means that the symbiont performs well. It provides nutrients to the host. Then that host can spawn in a given year versus other symbionts that, or other combinations of host and symbiont um, that don't have the same response. Maybe they spawned on a different night. Uh, we weren't out there the whole time to check. Um, but it has implications for how the system might respond to environmental changes moving forward. So that suggests to me that, that rapid evolution in this group is possible. You know, the pieces are there. Um, whether it plays out the same way in all corals or is an open question, but at least seem, it seems in this uh, instance that there's a chance for uh, feedback that could lead to more thermal tolerance in the future. And that's not even getting into the concept of coral switching symbionts or you know, having different species. Um, it's just within the variation that's already there within a standard host and symbiont population. So that's really exciting to me. Uh, because corals need help, right? So I'm going to transition here to the next section. I'm going to talk about restoration a bit. Again, I think you guys are probably familiar with restoration here, um, more so than some of the other people I've talked to in the past. But uh, these nurseries are fantastic. There are several located throughout the Florida Keys and elsewhere in the Caribbean. And they're essentially Christmas tree farms where you, you know, grow corals, um, again, by fragmentation, so asexual propagation. You break a colony apart, string it up on these trees. They grow out. You break them, grow more trees. And then ultimately, you plant these back onto denuded reef, where um, recovery may be helped by the presence of more biomass. Right. Uh, it's been a mixed bag in terms of success with this approach. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it works fairly well. A lot of times, these outplants don't do so well. Um, a lot of times, they die very quickly. And we don't really know exactly why um, and what's going into it. And so right now, the current approach is, well, you take everything in your nursery, and you outplant it to all the sites that you might want to restore, and you cross your fingers and see what survives there. That's not necessarily the most cost-effective approach, and restoration there aren't a lot of restoration dollars to go around. So it would be great if we could figure out a way, rather than outplanting everything everywhere, to target our outplants, um, to identify individuals that are perhaps better suited to a particular habitat than another. You know, we could put our cold tolerant uh, fragments into areas that experience cold winters, our heat tolerant ones elsewhere. Um, and if we can know that information, then we can improve the efficiency of restoration work. That's Niedermeyer's work. Yes, this, this nursery is Ken Niedermeyer's nursery, or it was. He told me that <clears throat> the ones in the trees do best, and the ones on the, on the bottom gets more mortality on the bottom. Yep, there are all sorts of problems with the bottom. You get um, predators are more abundant on the bottom. Uh, you have different flow rates on the <laughs> bottom. Um, so I think that's if most people have transitioned to using the trees if they can. Um, Corals grow faster up there. Could be groundwater pumping. Could, that could be it too. 
definitely. They certainly are more fragile than the ones that grow in the bottom. They tend to grow thicker uh, down there. Yeah? What about the method that Thomas Garot published in 2014 about uh, running electricity? Electricity? Yeah. Uh, I don't know of anyone here that's doing it. Um, that's, I think most of those pilot tests were done in the Indo-Pacific. Um, I know it weirdly works somehow. Yeah. So, so the idea is you have uh, sort of A-frames that are metal rebar, and you hook a current up to them, and it actually accelerates the growth rate. Um, yeah, I don't know much about it. <laughs> well, you finally published something in 2014. It's pretty interesting. Okay. I'll have to look into it more. Um, I, I will say that using this method, they've got more biomass than they can handle. Um, it, this, this seems to be working fairly well. Um, it's actually sort of problematic. They have, they're outplanting so much stuff, it's hard to tell what's been outplanted and what's, you know, what was originally there. Anyway, um, my, my second question and what I want to talk to you for the remainder of the time is how can we use genomic tools to inform restoration practice, make it more efficient? So uh, that question was what was posed recently to a, a group that's been working on um, Basically, the Coral Restoration Consortium is a group trying to improve restoration methods uh, based on science. And you might notice Ilsa up here somewhere, uh, <laughs> who unfortunately didn't make it out to Penn State when we had our meeting. Um, but we, we got together, and we were tasked with basically um, putting together a couple of reviews that take in all of what we currently know, or a lot of what we currently know, um, and coming up with a best practices guide. Um, and one of those actually just came out, which is great, so I recommend you read it. The other one that's still sort of in review hell uh, is the one that I want to talk to you about, which is developing biomarkers. <laughs> All right? So what is a biomarker? Um, it's basically any, any quantifiable, um, objectively measurable indicator of a biological process. Um, and I like to use the blood pressure example. Um, as basically, well, there are two different types of biomarkers. There are ones that are diagnostic and ones that are predictive. A good diagnostic marker would be something like your heart rate. Um, if I run up the stairs, my heart rate will be higher than it was when I was just resting. And that could give me an immediate diagnosis of my current state as stressed from running up the stairs. Predictive markers um, are ones that might tell you how you'll perform in the future, not just how you're reacting to something right now. And uh, blood pressure is a good one for that because you can get a sense of you know, whether someone's got a healthy blood pressure or they have hypertension. And you can basically um, adjust how you um, will tell that person to um, act in the future based on that information. And we basically want to come up with a blood pressure test for corals. How can we measure their performance in a way that will allow us to predict what they'll do in the future? One way would be through uh, gene expression. Um, which is the method that we used in that last example. What can we do with good biomarkers? This is the fun cell. We can do all sorts of things. We can monitor reef health. We can tell you know, whether corals are currently healthy or whether they're feeling um, sick. We can assess acute impacts, uh, recent heat shock events, um, pollution nearby. Uh, if there's some sort of signature in how the coral performs that we can relate back to those um, sort of source points of stress, uh, then we can you know, start to change our management plan in response to that. We could identify resilient individuals. You know, let's not waste money on this runt. It's, you know, it doesn't grow well. It's not very healthy. And it won't probably make the reefs of the future any safe, uh, stronger. Let's focus on this rock star genotype. Matching colonies to outplant sites. I think I mentioned you know, currently most corals uh, die when we outplant them. If we could figure out, you know, which ones will match to this site versus that one, could save us a lot of money in terms of propagation costs. And ultimately, again, we're trying to reduce risk, effort, and costs of restoration. That's all the great things that we could potentially do with fantastic biomarkers. But do we have fantastic biomarkers? <laughs> uh, this is usually how things go, right? You know, some new technology comes out and go, oh yeah, there's, there are great things that we could do. But then we're, we're really in this period right now of uh, coming back down to reality, right? And I'll, I'll give you some examples of that in this next project that I'm going to talk about.
So we really wanted to try to develop some gene expression biomarkers um, because it's, gene expression is very malleable. It, it changes quickly, and it could be a good indicator of something that's happened recently. Um, there are reasons why you might want that and why you might not, um, but we thought gene expression would be a good first start um, because you could assess a lot of genes at the same time and look for correlations between expression levels and performance metrics. And so we decided to do it in Florida at the different coral nurseries that we have here. A couple of reasons. Nurseries are really great tools for genetic experiments because they're essentially common garden experiments already. That's where you bring a bunch of different genotypes into one shared location. You can be pretty sure that any differences you observe in performance are related to the genotype rather than environmental differences. Also, you know, we've got gene expression capacity uh, for both the host and the symbiont. And we could sample across various seasons, so we could look at um, variability over time. And last, um, Florida's kind of unique. It's sort of in the marginal range for these species. Uh, again, we're, here we're focusing on a cropper serve cornice. Um, it gets very cold in the winter and very hot in the summer. And so there's a, a unique chance in Florida to test for synergy or antagonism in the gene expression files under different stresses. So that basically means if you know, a gene is upregulated in the summer in response to heat stress, what does it do in the winter in response to cold stress? Is it also upregulated? In which case that could potentially reinforce um, that response. But if it goes in the other direction, then it might constrain that response. Um, so there's a cool chance of looking at, at some of that that I'm actually really not going to get into too much. So I'll move on. <laughs> These are the three locations of the nurseries, one at the University of Miami. Uh, CRF is the Coral Restoration Foundation. That's Ken Niedemeyer's nursery in uh, Middle Keys. Then Lower Keys, we're working with Moat Marine Lab and Nature Conservancy. So we had a spectrum of locations. We had uh, various time points. So this is just uh, the sea surface temperature over the course of the two years that we did the experiments. And we timed it so that we would be sampling at four points around the summer thermal maximum and the winter thermal minimum uh, to basically get the range of what the corals are experiencing, um, which might impact how they sort of upregulate certain genes in anticipation for um, these temperature changes. Uh, jumped in the water grabbed samples of a bunch of different corals at the colony, um, put them into three different temperature treatments on the boat. I have a heat stress in this one. Thank you very much. Um, the reason that worked, these are really extreme temperatures. We only exposed them for an hour. Uh, there were a couple of practical reasons for that. Um, one, we, we wanted to shock them really hard and really fast so that we would get a clear gene expression response. Um, two, we didn't want to have to bring them back into a laboratory and slowly ramp them. That would have defeated the purpose of having these nurseries where they're already experiencing the same environment. Um, three, we want other nursery practitioners to be able to use this method in the future. So if we're developing a way for um, someone, you know, a manager to go out and test their corals, we want them to be able to give them this heat stress and then preserve the sample and send it to us. And so it had to be something that was fairly easy to do and had cheap components. Um, I only got shocked a couple of times, so <laughs> it wasn't too bad. So here's the design. This is what we ended up with. We had uh, three nurseries, again. We had those four seasons. We had three temperature treatments. And then at each of the nurseries, we had 10 distinct genetic uh, genotypes, which was a total of about 360 samples which at the time was a lot of samples to do an RNA-seq experiment on. You can probably do it now without, too much, without spending too much money, but when we did this, it was super expensive. And so instead of doing you know, RNA-seq on all of these, we did, first did it on a subset of samples. And that was going to allow us to identify some genes that responded in the right ways um, that we could then focus on with this open array, high throughput qPCR platform, which is really cool and probably very outdated now. Um, but this is basically a chip that lets you run thousands and thousands and thousands of qPCRs um, relatively quickly and relatively inexpensively. So basically, um, pick some genes and then test that subset of genes on all of the samples was the, the design. These are the genes that we ended up with. Not important. 
Um, they're, they're standard, heat shock genes, things that you might expect. And they, we ran them through a battery of tests to look at the patterns. And yeah, they were upregulated under the right conditions and downregulated under others. So um, we thought they'd be good. This is what the data looks like when you get it back. Um, so this is at just one nursery for the time being, right? On the x-axis, we've got the different host genotypes. On the y, we have basically the change in gene expression relative to ambient conditions, OK? So red is the hot treatment. Blue is the cold treatment. And this is at the upper nursery during one summer. This is a fairly consistent response, OK? Everybody was down related except for this guy, um, which is a really cool signal. That's, it's consistent and therefore potentially good at predicting some sort of uh, performance. So we, we can take these values and plot them. Again, expression on one axis. And here we decided to use growth as our phenotype of interest. Can we predict a growth? And we fit a linear line to something that probably should be a curve, but whatever. Uh, we ended up with a <laughs> relatively high um, correlation. A high correlation means, all right, predictive power, fantastic. This is a great biomarker for that season at that nursery, right? But we weren't just doing one season at one nursery. We were doing it all over the place. So you zoom out. This is, these are the four different time points, nursery one, two, and three, all the different genotypes laid out. You actually get a lot of variation depending on who you're looking at, right? And so when we convert all of that to these um, correlation values, made another heat map. This is, this is just the same information from before, but it's demonstrating that um, you know, we have a high orange color associated with that 0.75 positive correlation. You can have a, a strong negative correlation, which is also predictive, so deep purple colors. What we're hoping to see here in this plot of the diff all the different genes against the different seasons and treatments are dark colors that are shared across season, but that's not what we get. We get this patchwork, right? A bunch of different colors, or in, in a lot of cases, no color, meaning there was very low predictive value. So even though we tested a bunch of different genes that seem like they fit the profile, what we're finding is it's really hard for them to, be, to predict anything. This is um, growth. We also looked at mortality and bleaching resilience. And in every case, it came back the same way. A lot of noise. So I'm getting close to the end, which is good, because we're at the end. To summarize everything, um, this is too broad. The, the thing that I really want to focus on <laughs> is that the, uh, the, the biomarkers, while they could potentially be really useful, we are not there yet. Um, we need to work harder. Well, not harder. We need to work more on it. Um, we need more experiments. We possibly need to look at different types of biomarkers. Gene expression could just not be uh, the best option because it changes so radically um, and so quickly and so noisily. Uh, also, the, the phenotypes of performance that we looked at were measured on a yearly scale, but our sampling for gene expression was like an hour. Um, so partially, uh, the mismatch between the time scales could be a factor. Um, we might want to look at biomarkers uh, you know, sort of in total over time, or look at a bunch of different genes um, that might together be predictive rather than individually like I tried to do. Um, Someone just came out with a paper last year where they found uh, a biomarker for disease resilience that was predictive, I think, 70% of the time it could tell you whether a given coral was going to be resistant to a disease prior to exposing the coral to that disease. So just because mine didn't work doesn't mean that others won't work. And surprisingly well, like 70% predictive capacity is fantastic. So, um, so the jury is out a little bit, um, but I think with uh, more work and, and hopefully a little time, uh, we'll have better biomarkers. Um, and that can really help, again, with restoration. So corals are evolving. Um, there's, well, they're probably evolving. I didn't actually measure that directly, right? Uh, but we, we have a lot of indicators that there's capacity for them to evolve in symbiosis with, uh, with their algae. And um, we have some biomarkers that will hopefully um, allow us to predict some performance capacity in the future. So if you combine those together, uh, it's reasonable to think that in the future, uh, restoration will continue to be successful and get better and better as time goes on as we accumulate more data, particularly about some of these genotypes that now have been in nurseries for a while and we have a lot of uh, 
different experiments, and we can overlay all that information together um, and, yeah, improve restoration going forward. So I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much.